I want to give you um, some background that informs the perspective I'm going to give you. Um, firstly, uh, since I um, ceased to be Chief Risk Officer of Standard Chartered at the end of 2015, I now, well, I've, I've been chairing a number of uh, board risk committees, uh, including most recently, I will have joined the board of Zopa, which uh, is, in fact, was the first peer-to-peer -peer lending platform in the world and is um, uh, undoubtedly the UK's most successful fintech company, which, interestingly enough, is now wishing to get a banking license. I won't go into that. But more than that, I, over more than two decades, very much in the times, I held roles in risk. Um, immersed myself with industry bodies, with chief risk officer forums. So my observations are not built on just, you know, standard chartered, but discussions with people. And indeed, in the last 18 months, I regularly meet with the chairs of the board risk committees of the, all the major foreign-owned investment banks regulated in the UK, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan's, and so on. And again, this informs this perspective. So I think there's a fair amount of background in it. What I want to cover today is given that this is about the future of finances, give my assessment of what I think are the key developments affecting the banking industry. And my perspective is very much that of large, uh, multinational, often universal banks covering corporate and institutional banking and retail banking, which is where I've spent most of my career. The current state of the risk management discipline is then something I want to stand back and say, well, where do I think we are? Because that then brings to the final section of my presentation, what are the challenges facing risk and how are these external developments enabling, and the state of the risk management discipline enabling us to face those challenges? I also want to give you just one other piece of background. I spent the first four and a half years of my working career as an auditor with Arthur Anderson, auditing manufacturing and retail companies, and I will forever be grateful that I did that because something else that has informed my entire 30 years in banking is an ongoing state of incredulity at how poorly banks manage themselves. Uh, and I, by that I don't mean manage their risks, although they've all, all been examples, I mean manage themselves. Their ability to manage their processes, their understanding of their costs and what makes them tick. Essentially, it's an industry that for so many years was so fat and comfortable and living off such large margins that an entire industry barely developed the ability to manage itself with precision in the way that the best run manufacturing industries or industries that run off much thinner margins have to. And this matters for risk and presents an ongoing current up-to-date challenge today that I still think all too many banks are struggling to rise to. So what are the key developments? If you're sitting now, as I do, at the board of a bank or the executive committee for many years at Standard Chartered, I mean, post-crisis, inadequate profitability is a real problem. It's much more of a problem with corporate and institutional banks and much more of a problem with international corporate and institutional banks, less of a problem for a retail SME-focused bank that is in an oligarchic structural uh, industry. But nevertheless, I think everyone struggles to some degree with profitability. Why? Obviously, higher capital for very good reasons, higher liquidity requirements. Increased regulatory compliance costs. And, and here I am including the role, there's no point in complaining about it as a role that has been established by legislation, but banks have had a very onerous role as law enforcement agencies forced upon them. Uh, and they are interestingly expected to perform that role to a far higher standard than any state law enforcement agency is expected to. With regulators waiting to pounce, you know, on a very small percentage of errors and deliver large fines. Again, no point in complaining about it, but what it has done is that it has sucked a huge amount of investment dollars for firms already facing a profitability challenge as an imperative must be done, but going to something that will hopefully keep the banks out of trouble and avoid these huge fines in future, but doesn't deal with any other of the structural profitability challenges and often prevents adequate investment in innovation and so on. 
And of course, the huge regulatory fire settlements themselves, which is the ultimate prize of making this investment, avoiding those in future, as I think some speakers have alluded to, probably haven't yet gone away, although I would hope that we are at the high water mark. There's still some to come, but then hopefully um, as the investment in the much improved um, compliance infrastructure comes through, that will fade away and cease to be a factor. And indeed, perhaps there will be less of an ongoing incremental investment requirement. But a big problem. I mean, I am not aware with the probable exception of JP Morgan, and think of its sheer scale, I'm not aware of a major corporate and institutional bank, and I include investment banking within that, that is making today close to its cost of equity. And this is now at a time that impairments are at cyclical lows. So this is not a case of, uh, and, and bear in mind the, the typical cost of equity, which tends to be 10, 11%. Uh, that's what you should achieve on average through the cycle. So if you're achieving significantly below that when your impairments are at a cyclical lows, you are way off adequate profitability. And I don't think anyone has any clear answer to that. As, as market shares grow, as players drop out, then the, the, you know, the ultimate survivors will undoubtedly benefit from some repricing power through that. But the scale issue is that, you know, unless you're incredibly big, I don't think... Um, you know, that, that is an advantage because it means you can actually spread the enormous overhead involved in running a bank, like all these compliance costs and so on, obviously over uh, a much greater base. But by the way, if you're not that scale, as you know, regulators have absolutely set their face against banks doing anything significant in the inorganic space, so there's not an awful lot you can do about it uh, in terms of doing inorganic activity. And of course, the other one, we've heard a lot about it today, is... Um, digitalization and datification, disruptive technology, call it what you will, but technology-induced change that um, at the moment has not had a dramatically disruptive effect in terms of draining large numbers of customers away from banks, but clearly carries that threat. You think of something like open banking in the UK, which is due to come in and which will enable startup companies to get much more direct access to working with established bank customers. Um, transforming data into new forms of information and hence value. We've heard about data mining and artificial intelligence. Clearly, that's potentially a threat of outside startups can do things better, but it also offers opportunities, as we also heard, if they work with established banks. Um, and indeed, if banks can find the investment dollars to do some of their own innovation. That was a strong desire of mine in my final few years as the chief risk officer, but bluntly, uh, neither I nor most of my business colleagues were able to get access to a meaningful sum. So we all did very interesting trips to Silicon Valley and found all sorts of exciting you know, ideas that you wish to put into a, an R&D lab, and then generally the dollars were not available to be able to do that, which was very frustrating, because I think any well-run business, as uh, has been commented earlier, needs to find some ability to do that. And, you know, existing banks are potentially such mines of interesting data. I mean, one of the most exciting ones that we did get underway, uh, you know, it's 18 months since I moved on, so I don't know how it went, but was Standard Chartered, I think, has something like... Um, 9% of the trade flows in, 9 or 10% market share of the trade flows in its particular footprint, you know, so, uh, uh, so Asia to the rest of the world, wherever that is, back and so on. And you think about that, what, what the, the source of data that potentially is, whether it could be for money laundering, assessing the risk of companies, because you're getting all this data about what, who's buying what and, and so on. That was something that I thought was potentially uh, a very exciting source of information. And in fact, that was the one project we launched. Uh, uh, one of the few regrets, you know, when, when you move on is that you don't always get to see everything go through. The second thing I want to comment on is I am still amazed today at how poorly in most institutions, or when I talk to other chief risk officers, the role of the banking chief risk officer is articulated. Uh, I have a very complete view of what the role of a group chief risk officer is. And I have held that view because I first articulated it back when I was appointed in 2006, so this owes nothing to the crisis. I really, in its simplest terms, see the chief risk officer 
as having an ongoing obligation to ensure that the organization has a fully effective risk management framework in place. And what does an effective risk management framework do? It really must ensure that all potentially material risks, and the word potentially is important, have been identified and can be measured with sufficient accuracy to make a satisfactory evaluation as to whether it's material to the institution or not. And of course, that's not a point in time thing only, that's an ongoing requirement. And then crucially, you have to find a way of setting a risk appetite for all those material risks. Group material, bluntly, that needs to be the board of the institution, needs to consciously apply its mind and take a meaningful view of risk in a way that is based on what potential outcomes could arise from taking that risk. I am never very impressed where uh, risk appetite statements are either simply statements of motherhood and apple pie, because that doesn't mean, I mean, it's very e we all sign up to statements of motherhood and apple pie, but you're not taking zero risk. You still have to try and ask yourself, what is the potentially adverse outcome with which I am comfortable and regard as consistent with the business model we are running? And then, of course, as chief risk officer, you have a responsibility to ensure that all risks are managed so that you have a very high probability of remaining within that risk appetite. And that's your job on the executive committee. And finally, to specify an overall architecture for the management and control of material risks. So what are your governance structures? What are your authority structures? What are your reporting structures? Which ensure that you have neither gaps nor overlaps. And overlaps are a problem because they, they tend to lead at best to inefficiency and at worst to confusion and therefore the inadequate management and control of risks. So measured against those standards, what is my sense of the current state of risk management discipline in banking today? I now introduce the word discipline. That's not an accident. I regard there as being five broad risk management disciplines. I'm going to come to areas because one of the things that bedevils the industry is a tendency to bandy terms around that have become fashionable, that all overlap with other concepts. And so where you have dialogues where people you know, all use the same language and potentially mean entirely different things in terms of narrowness, breadth of concept. So conduct risk, in my view, is not a discipline. Compliance risk is not a discipline. I'll come to their role, but the disciplines are credit risk, which I think we would all agree is now very well developed. Um, I think Basel II and the requirement for banks that chose to apply for the advanced model completed the puzzle there. Obviously, certain credit risk disciplines have been well done for decades, but essentially the ability to model portfolios and how they behave under stress required the investment in the infrastructure that Basel II was hugely instrumental in getting banks to do. So I think that's a well developed discipline. By the way, of course, when, you, when I say a discipline is well developed, that doesn't mean you don't always have to maintain concentration to ensure you're doing it well, but the discipline is there, the techniques are there, you just need to concentrate, your governance needs to ensure you're not forgetting what concentrations you have, you're not missing new ones and so on. But I don't see a lot of new techniques. I think, uh, you know, datafication, data mining can improve some of those techniques, but I'm not aware of any great gap that makes it impossible to manage or, or very unlikely that you can manage a bank's risks well today. Market risk, I think, also well developed. Um, always important with market risk, that uh, a phrase I use quite frequently to remember that because it is based on models and models are great till they're not. And what I mean by that is, you know, they built on an assumption of market liquidity, past performance, and you always have to be looking forward and saying, the model is fine, but the outside world may be changing. You've got to ask yourself and, and be forward looking about, uh, is that happening? So for example, with, you know, City Global Markets, where I sit, which is in, you know, all, all the uh, range of, of derivative type products, as you have competitors, dropping out, you're getting less and less liquidity. I mean, this, uh, this has also been a, a factor. And so you have to say to yourself, models that are based on much greater liquidity might actually perform very poorly if you had a shock event in a much less liquid market. So you have to keep doing that. But again, I, I'm not aware of any you know, great techniques that are missing liquidity risk. I think um, 
Well, actually, I think the, the techniques have been there for a while. Clearly, a lot of banks lost sight of applying them in the run-up to the crisis. Uh, regulators have obviously come along and forced a whole lot of measures, not all good, but nevertheless, I think liquidity risk as a discipline is now in a very good shape in the industry. Capital earnings risk as a discipline may not be one that many people would recognize, but what I have in mind there is that fundamental to managing risk appetite, articulating risk appetite, getting a real acceptance at board level of risk appetite, is the ability to model capital and earnings volatility. And while the ability to model what happens to a credit portfolio is, I think, now very good, I don't think, and I say this from my own experience, that we've yet made ourselves very good at modeling what happens to revenue and costs in the future. And that will likely have even a greater impact than what happens to your credit portfolios. Um, and indeed, it was very interesting, you know, as my former institution uh, has is just emerging from what was a, a 1 in 25 a downturn event for it. What the, the actual performance of the credit portfolios as modeled held up, and we totally underestimated the extent to which revenue would fall. I mean, we drew on all our past experience, and revenue has fallen far more than any past experience of the bank. And that just left me again with thinking whether there are, uh, you know, um, new modeling techniques that could be developed working with data miners and so on to get a lot better at modeling how your revenue might fall because ultimately risk is what happens to your earnings and in the end of it all comes from revenue falling the fact that your credit portfolios have performed as expected is great but it doesn't change the fact that your PL didn't perform as expected and that still leaves management with the same problem with investors and I include in that franchise and strategic risk because as you are looking forward now, if you're looking at a five-year strategic plan, you've also got to be saying to yourself, how reliable is my past experience of what margins I'm earning from things? You know, what, what threats are there to the future? You know, you, you're putting on a balance sheet today, but the, the pre-impairment earnings to absorb any of those losses may turn out to be quite different. So I think that's a discipline that is adequate in the sense that I think under regulatory pressure, we've all come a long way, but it's probably not as good as it needs to be for a board running a business to be truly comfortable. And bluntly, operational risk. Now, operational risk I regard as the discipline. There are bodies of knowledge, so absolutely we all need compliance experts who have deep knowledge about what the rules and regulations are imposed by various regulators and, and laws around the world, but that in and of itself is not a discipline. The discipline of operational risk management is the ability to get yourself to be able to reliably monitor whether your risks are under control. And here my experience right to the present day is very sobering. Often, and I, I also sit on the audit committees where, where I'm a board member, often the state of controls is reported to audit committees. It could be reported uh, to, to a risk committee. It doesn't matter. I have yet to sit at an audit committee that receives information that gives itself any meaningful ability to, you know, to stand up and say, I really understand the state of controls. And it is controls that above all determine whether your operational risks are under control. Yes, occasionally banks interpret rules and regulations wrongly. That does happen. But far more than that happening is that the banks were very clear what they wished to achieve, were not remotely achieving it, and didn't have the faintest idea at senior executive level, or even, frankly, the, the manager of the goddamn department where things were going wrong. And certainly not the board didn't have the faintest idea it was out of control till the day there's some very unfortunate event, or if they're lucky, till the third line audit pointed out to them. But bluntly, if audit is finding material things, the third line, that your first and second line we're not informing you of. You are not in a good state of control. It is totally unacceptable, in my view, to place primary reliance on your third line to know whether you're under control. Another challenge I've put to board audit committees is, OK, let's assume we received no information from the third line. They didn't turn up. They didn't do a report. Do you think you have any real view about the state of control in this organization? 
And if I then tell you that the management themselves at their own governance committees also don't have that view, how do you actually even remotely believe you're under control? You cannot be under control through a third line. And in fact, one of the things I find, I think regulators have overwhelmingly been very you know, strong forces for good in the post-crisis environment. You know, we can all disagree with individual things, but I think they've placed far too much emphasis on demanding more resources going into the third line. No third line can make up for an inadequate first and second line. And the discipline of operational risk is ensuring that you have the same ability with operational risks to know that you are under control as you do with credit and market risks. And on that criteria, I think the industry has not come anywhere near far enough. And when I share this perspective with those bodies, I do not find people disputing that. That is very troubling. So let's look at the implications of the industry challenges for risk management. So profit, profitability challenges. Um, well, what, you know, for me, when you sit in a bank, you can lament what's going on on the outside world, but what you have to say to yourself is that if we have inadequate profitability, is there more that we can do today to run ourselves more efficiently? And the answer to that is absolutely there is. When you go back to my early observation about how poorly managements, uh, banks tend to manage themselves, there is huge scope to improve the efficiency of banks. But that requires a level of engagement by executives at every level that I largely find absent. You will not improve your efficiency by subcontracting it to the chief technology officer and hoping that he will magic up some software program that will miraculously automate all your processes while you continue to devote your time only to worrying about revenue and revenue margins. is isn't going to happen. It's, you know, it's something that managers who are responsible for product lines, managing departments have to embrace themselves. And I continue to be amazed at the sheer reluctance to do so. Perhaps I'm not amazed at the reluctance. I know why there's reluctance, because I've realized that the skills to do so are so deplete in the industry that people are frightened of it. But if you let the managers not do so, and I'm amazed at how much that still continues, you will never run your institution efficiently. And if you don't run your institution efficiently, you by definition will not be running it reliably. Efficient processes are reliable processes, and reliable processes are efficient processes. They're simply both sides of the same coin. You're deluding yourself if you think you can have uh, you know, reliable processes that are wildly inefficient. And again now, this really matters because what do digitization and datafication disruptive technology do? That One of the things they potentially do is increase the range and complexity of operational risk. So I'm not going to go, you know, people have talked about cyber risk, but obviously cyber risk, uh, we'll come on to some over in the next slide, you know, huge increases. And that is the area where, in my assessment, you know, most major banking institutions are poor. And that's where the complexity is going to grow, and they're not very good at it today. And of course, it potentially increases the range of strategic threats, as you have uh, many startups um, potentially over time going to erode uh, customer base and profitability in the industry. The principal operational risk areas that, that came to my mind, and I wouldn't pretend this is exhaustive, but you know, IT security and data security are crucial, and this is where cyber threats are, are one of many threats. But interesting enough, of course, it's not just cyber. Uh, it was very interesting. At my former institution, we used to still find the easiest way. Uh, we used to do these tests where um, we would actually get people to enter the bank, you know, tailgate, and eventually get onto the executive floor and take information off our desks. And it was amazing how easy it was to do. So you can also lose sight of the fact that even with cards and turnstiles, it's not that difficult. It was, wasn't to get onto the executive floor and take papers off our desks. So, Point being, wherever you can go wrong, you have to be concentrating, so don't allow the crucial area of cyber risk to distract yourself from other areas. Um, and as we've seen, you know, that can be very franchise damaging if you um, suffer loss of customer data or becomes public. I don't pretend to have the expertise, but uh, I, like many people, am excited in um, principle by what distributed ledgers may be able to offer, but I just um, as, a, as a chief risk officer, chair of the board risk committee, interested in the whole crypto key storage and how reliable that would be and would certainly want to hear someone come and make some convincing uh, presentations on that um, in advance of, of going live. Algorithmic risk, I'm thinking now that we place, so for example, it was the uh, city, 
entity on which I chair the risk committee that uh, had the employee of the flash crash in Tokyo. You may remember Sterling dropped a ridiculous amount and so on. And, and that was a case in the early hours of the morning, relatively junior trader and, you know, uh, overuse and an algorithm without thinking. And, and frankly, the regulators have just been all over us uh, for that. I mean, deep, deeply embarrassing. But it's a you know, recognition that as we bring more algorithms in for very good reasons, they create a set of their own, even if only reputational risks, but obviously potentially worse than that. And then operational resilience, um, again, uh, here, both opportunities and threats arising from the changes in the world to your ability to keep yourself functioning you know, day in and day out, your critical processes without breaking down. That again, of course, uh, is entirely, as I go on to say in the second point here, at one with efficiency, resilience, and operational risk control go together. If you solve one, you will inevitably solve them all. And that's why I say we've got to get real on the discipline of operational risk management. I do not, do not see how we will rise to the challenges of these potentially, I realize there may be a lot of hype, but these potential threats that come from all sorts of new startups, if we haven't learnt how to manage ourselves reliably and efficiently, and generally we haven't. And so I, as a board member, as a chair of the board risk committee, when I was the chief risk officer, even with the profitability challenges, I do think the chief risk officer and anyone who has influence ought to be making the case very strongly that this is essential, it's essential, there's no way of avoiding it, there's no shortcuts, and of course, that if you make the investments and do achieve the sort of industrial strength quality processes that you see in other industries, it will pay off both defensively and offensively in the sense that you will be so much better equipped to go out and take on these external challenges. The failure to do so, you know, at best will result in some franchise erosion and for the most vulnerable institutions, those that don't have dominant market shares, you know, which, you know, I'm not saying those are not threatened, but I don't think those are so easy threatened. But if you're, you know, an international bank, you know, um, struggling with very low profitability today, then you do over time risk strategic oblivion. And by the way, one, one very interesting aside, and again, obviously one, one always want, monitors one's previous institutions, I thought it was very, and I still have a lot of shares in Standard Chartered, so in that sense I wasn't pleased, but I thought it was very forward-looking of Moody's to downgrade, as it did a couple of months ago, Standard Chartered, not for balance sheet risks, but for its reduced pre-impairment profitability, which has made it now a greater credit risk. So nothing to do with what's on its balance sheet, but of its inability or lack of ability to absorb future losses. And I think that's exactly the right sort of thought process. But this is an interesting thing for a chief risk officer because you, know, you should be very aware of what is going to get your institution potentially downgraded. And I think that probably came as quite a shock, but I think it's the right thinking. And it shows that as the chief risk officer, you need to be absolutely um, you know, exerting your influence on executive committees and at boards to recognize that this fundamental efficiency and improvement of profitability is just necessary on all fronts, including the narrower riskiness of the organization as it will be perceived by the outside world. So the CRO really does need to be a force in insist upon and driving this transformational improvement. And by the way, just one last comment, as, as a chair of a board risk committee, you know, it's only when you take these things on. Interestingly, I find that you, as a chair of a board risk committee, need to bring exactly the same perspective and thought processes that you brought as chief risk officer. Obviously, you've swapped, uh, you know, earning less money for much less anxiety about having to deliver, you know, as opposed to challenging, questioning, and so on. But nevertheless, you sit down, I find, uh, you know, when you apply your mind to the job with exactly the same mindset uh, as, in my view, a chief risk officer ought to. So that was uh, my take, and uh, back to whoever's comparing. Thank you. Okay, so a number of questions have just been coming in, so I'll just quickly roll through them for you. Um, I know you've talked about this, um, Richard, but what are the key ingredients to being a strong chief risk officer? 
Actually, I, interesting, these are, these are again observations that I've made long ago. I think the first is to be naturally good at risk, you need to, at least in the work context, have a dispassionate personality. I was quite often amazed at our group executive committee, you know, nine people, including the chief executive, but how prone they were to what I found to be just irrational mood swings, you know, which could be over exuberant or over gloom. I genuinely think a risk officer, a chief risk officer needs naturally to think in probabilities. You know, things are not certain, it's about how likely they are and the extent to which you can absorb the impact even if it's an outlier. Um, but if you find you're, you know, yourself prone to mood swings of over-optimism, over-pessimism, you should probably seek something else. Um, the second thing is, and I have felt this very strongly from the word go, I, I don't have the view that a chief risk officer would automatically make a bad chief executive, but I don't think a chief risk officer can do their job well if they strongly aspire to be the chief executive. Hmm. Um, and the reason I say that is that, uh, you know, when you look at your colleagues around the executive committee who were aspiring to be one of those, to be the next chief executive, I saw all too often the, um, their behavior meant they were making political calculations. And certainly I, if I now in a board risk role, would be wanting to believe at least that I was signing off on a chief risk officer that was indifferent at, at, at best to whether they got the role or maybe for whatever reason had positively ruled it out as something they aspired to. The third thing, and, 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 uh, thing is um, I think you need a real breadth of intellectual curiosity to be a chief. You know, you're not there to make up for your excellent credit people, your excellent market risk people. You possibly are there to make up for your less than excellent operational risk people, but until you can train you know, someone or, or, or find someone to do it, you are there to range constantly over the totality and to link those disciplines into the broader strategic equation. And again, I'm not sure that enough chief risk officers even realize to themselves that that's what they ought to be doing. So those would be my three most important. That was excellent. Um, what's your view of cocoa bonds as a risk management tool? As a risk management tool, uh, I've always had the view that they're laughable. I think probably is. Uh, <laughs> so, from the bank's point of view, they're bad. What about as a means for compensating um, senior management? Compensating Credit Suisse, for example, has famously uh, yeah, well, been that awarding was, them. and good luck to them because what they shrewdly realised instantly is how undervalued they were, and it was just another way of getting their snouts in the trough. If you're going back to the, <laughs> the post crisis thing, but yeah. you know, good luck to them. But is, no, I, I, it, it seems to me to uh, you know that that's also now becoming a bit absurd about you know um, of how you reward management. I think the truth is we need to get a bit more mundane about how you reward management. Um, interesting enough, I, I think now the regulators have pushed it out too far because, you know, uh, you think that if you leave an institution and you still got comp on the table seven years from now, I think, it, I can't even think how the decisions that you took up to leaving would be a material factor, you know, if the bank sort of blows itself up seven years later. I mean, we had a hell of a long duration, you know, book that you must have put in place. In fact, I think that's gone too far. Um, you, you know, I, I think we've seen that efforts to align the comp of executives generally with shareholders, while good in principle has been an ongoing struggle. So, and I realize this is a, a, a you know, so you'd still be very well paid, but the Puritan in me says it would be a better idea ultimately if we just got paid as we are, professional managers, not entrepreneurs. Uh, it's not obvious to me why we ought to be rewarded like entrepreneurs, and therefore we should just be very well paid for doing complex, challenging, demanding, time-consuming, exhausting jobs, which not that many people could do, so you should be well paid, but it should be by reference probably to the, the best paid people in other professions. That's just a personal view. So I, I just think there's no more engineering to be done on compensation. I think we've now created a situation where most rational people look at their fixed comp, including in Europe, these allowances, and the rest, they just kind of go, well, it's a bit of a lottery ticket that may or may not pay off at some distant point which has rendered it, therefore, a bit meaningless as a motivator, it seems to me. Um, yep, yeah, go ahead. 
thank you for your insight and for giving us more of a, a global perspective. I wonder if you could sort of look at sort of how the Canadian banks have done and their chief risk officers and, you know, is there now an opportunity for the Canadian banks to go over into the UK as um, sort of the, the work that we've done with them here and they've actually done pretty well. Well, that's why, I mean, I'm, I'm very supportive of the, what the GRI is doing because uh, I still actually personally think there's a big gap globally in the articulation and dissemination of risk management standards. <laughs> I was on the board of GARP. I think it does an excellent job in a fairly narrow area of doing education and training. I was for many years uh, on the executive and indeed vice chair of IFRI, which is a CRO club. You, you know, you have to be a CRO of one of the major insurance companies or banks. Very good talking shop, but not surprisingly, that you had to be one, so therefore you were always too busy to put too much time into it and, and so on. But I, I think there's a, a great scope. For the Canadian banks, I mean, look, the Canadian banks ran themselves, uh, you know, and I, I'm not close enough to know what extent it was under their own volition, to what extent it was through you know, good regulation here, but they ran themselves soberly and sensibly, and that rightly paid off for them you know, very handsomely during the crisis. Uh, I don't know how efficient Canadian banks are. You know, we think of my earlier comments, I just don't know. I do think that any bank that has got that has now made great progress on running itself reliably and efficiently, why shouldn't it if, it, you know, if, if um, other markets are open to them? Absolutely, they should go forth and, and seek to win business in those markets because it remains very valid that if you can spread the same amount of overhead over a broader revenue base, you ought to be doing so just as a matter of good business sense. So I don't think a Canadian bank should, you know, other than if they do believe they've accomplished that, should other than go forth. I mean, Scotia Bank, you know, has been one of the few banks in the world outside uh, City and some British banks that, of course, has been adventurous in emerging markets in the case of Latin America, and that makes perfect sense. Uh, 